Uh, my name is Laura Sasaki. I'm the Broadband Initiatives Manager at the California Department of Technology in the Office of Broadband and Digital Literacy. And I want to welcome you to the fourth and the final Outcome Area Working Group for Digital Literacy and Inclusion. Um, before we get started, just a reminder that this uh, meeting is being recorded. It will be made available along with um, the slides and the transcript on the Broadband for All portal once we've concluded. Um, I will remind people of this again later, and there will be some links in the chat so that you know where to find that. Um, we'll take a look at the agenda next. Um, we're started, we'll start with some housekeeping items and then move into takeaways from our May meeting, kind of what we learned from participants and panelists. We'll have today's opening panel and then move into the community discussion where we hear from you and then discuss both the public surveys and the digital equity ecosystem mapping survey and tool, and then discuss what's going on with the digital equity plan, the next steps for that, and um, wrap things up. So next slide, please. Just a reminder, um, for those who are deaf or hard of hearing, we do have an ASL interpreter, and if you select the side-by-side -side speaker mode, that's the best way to be able to view Rex as he is providing the interpretation for us. Uh, closed captioning also available. Um, and now it comes to chat. This is where we would love to hear from you. Please, if you can, just add your name, where you're from, um, where you're joining us from as well, with, and um, that gives us uh, everyone just a chance to say hello to one another. When we get to the, um, the uh, community discussion, please use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That way we can call on people in order and also see who wants to provide comment. So next slide, please. All right, so some takeaways from our May meeting. Um, some of the things that we learned here were that really the, the criticality of partnerships to success, um, specifically with organizations on the ground, so in the community, and also very specifically um, leveraging in language support. The importance of train the trainers and peer training and support models. We also heard about allocating funding, funding is always huge, to increase digital navigating capacity throughout California as well as the awareness of resources and support being a key challenge. I know that we've heard a lot throughout the last few meetings, just sometimes people are simply not aware of the resources that are available and that are out there. So those are some of our takeaways from May. And if we'd like to move into the next slide. Um, what we have heard from this group, these part, you guys as participants, um, our, our speakers over the, the course of these meetings are that um, unaffordable internet plans and um, lack of access to infrastructure, um, just availability of infrastructure, um, really prevents people from uh, receiving uh, critical resources that are available online, whether it's healthcare, education, workforce, um, any of the, any number of those, those things. Um, inequitable adoption and utilization. Um, and this is particularly in the non-English speaking community as well as the disabled community. And then lack of affordable and accessible uh, devices. And when we say appro for, appropriate for the level of need, we talked a little bit um, in, in some of our groups about what a standard for a device is. You may have a different standard if it is a student with education, if it is an individual with disabilities, there are different standards out there and some of these devices can be very cost prohibitive. So the other barrier can be um, limited skills training opportunities when folks really need it. So where are there resources that people can access for digital skills training? So those are some of the barriers. So now let's look at some of the strategies and solutions that we heard. So these again are coming from you um, from our previous meetings. So some recommended strategies from, these group, from this group, um, provide affordable devices for those in need, especially for those within the covered populations. And we've talked about the covered populations uh, many times at these meetings. 
um, supporting access to digital literacy, literacy training and services specifically through community organizations. So again, those trusted messengers um, in the community who are interacting with uh, various members of both cover populations and just the, the community at large. Also ensuring that digital literacy services that are out there are really tailored to the specific populations of individuals that are being served. Again, it's talking about who you're working with in your community, what populations, whether we go back to in language, like we were talking about on the previous slide as a barrier, um, just making sure that it's not a one size fits all and that we're meeting people where they are. So also promoting community outreach efforts for resources, um, just making sure that there is awareness around what is available for affordability and accessibility. Um, the affordable connectivity program is one that immediately comes to mind for me. And then finally, conducting outreach campaigns and materials that are culturally competent and again in language. We heard culturally competent many, many times in the recommended strategies and really wanted to call that out here. So again, thank you all for um, continuing to have the conversation and providing us with these recommended strategies from our previous meetings. All right, so I think we're going to move on to our speakers. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so we are going to hear from um, Curtis Gibbs and Yesenia Hernandez from the Community Action Partnership um, for Orange County. Um, we will also be hearing from uh, Rigo Hernandez from the American GI Forum, Greg Walker from Great Harvest, um, from uh, San Bernardino, Arlene Krebs, Loaves, Fishes, and Computers, and Andy Urita from um, uh, Bite Back in San Francisco. So we're going to go ahead and start with um, Curtis and Yesenia, and then um, just let me know, cue me when you guys are wrapped up, and then we'll um, move along. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Curtis Gibbs. I'm the Director of Planning and Business Development for the Community Action uh, Partnership of, of Orange County. I, I've been with CAPOC for approximately uh, seven years. And prior to that, I was with the Los Angeles Redevelopment Agency for almost 30 years. And during that last uh, 10 years, worked uh, really closely to try and bring internet and uh, web presence and actually fiber into watch and our disadvantaged uh, communities. So um, CAPOC has recently been put under contract with SCAG uh, to help on uh, out, broadband outreach relative to the federal uh, subsidy. I think it uh, was our experience doing Census 2020 innovative outreach that brought us to their attention. And so I'm going to introduce Yesenia Hernandez, our uh, senior planner, who's going to give a little bit more background on CAP OC and some of the things that we've experienced trying to work with those that have these barriers to uh, digital literacy. Uh, Yesenia, take it away. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Yesenia Hernandez. As they said, I'm the senior planner at CAP OC. Um, also with us on the call are some other people from CAP OC, so Alexander Caro, Manager of Planning, and then Carolyn Coleman, Community Engagement Liaison. So CAP OC is a multi-service anti-poverty agency in Orange County, um, working to address immediate needs and empower disadvantaged and low-income communities for the past 50 years. Um, we provide programs and services through our three family resource centers and provide program countywide, such as utility assistance, water assistance, workforce development, youth services, and the Orange County Food Bank. Through the Orange County Food Bank, we actually distribute 25,000 food boxes um, in the greater Orange County um, every month to low-income seniors at 70 food distributions. Um, and then in 2022, we actually distributed over 26 million pounds of food. Um, we also have a diaper program um, where we pass out diapers throughout the county. Um, every two years, our agency conducts a community needs assessment, um, also called the CNA, um, to help us understand the causes and conditions of poverty. Um, so we actually are just finishing the, the, the CNA right now. 
Um, the CNA consists of a survey and community meetings to gather data directly from participants and residents of Orange County. Um, and actually through our research study, um, we've had a few questions where we've talked about digital, um, just like broadband and all that st stuff. And we've actually had res um, parents who've come to our community meetings vocalize a desire um, to improve their own technology skills and education, um, especially, you know, with the pandemic, they felt like they were being left behind. They couldn't help their um, children with it. Um, and we also found this year um, that there, that a lot of the people who responded to um, took our survey, um, they found that the lack of access to technology was affecting their computer literacy. Um, a lot of them expressed it was, they found this difficult. Um, and also, even just when we're conducting our own survey and, you know, trying to collect data, even though we offer our survey online, you know, to make it more accessible in different languages, um, we have found that providing it in print is actually much more successful. Um, you actually get a lot more, you know, participants. Um, obviously, that's a lot more work on our end because then we have to do data input. Um, but it's just kind of um, signals, you know, the, the divide. Um, a program that Capital C has, um, or had, I should say, um, that we found to be really successful um, was our success coaches. So the success coaches worked with seniors for 60 to 120 days. Um, they worked one-on-one -on -one to set goals, provide guidance and support, access to resources and developing skills or strategies to meet those goals. Uh, what we found that was, was that over 50% of seniors, their goals revolved around digital literacy. So they wanted to learn how to use technology to communicate remotely um, and, you know, and connect to the world, especially as the program started in January, 2021. Um, you know, almost a year into the pandemic and with the isolation, a lot of seniors felt like, you know, they hadn't seen their families in a long time. They didn't want to just connect, you know, via voice. They kind of, they wanted to do video calls. Um, they also wanted to learn, I would say, simpler things um, that maybe a lot of us take for granted, like, you know, accessing the internet, pictures, sending and receiving text messages, downloading apps. Um, using Zoom, even accessing on like banking and shopping. And some even sought to like master technology a little bit better. So um, one of our participants wanted to return to school. So, you know, she needed to learn how to use the internet, how to use Zoom and all that stuff. Uh, we also had somebody who wanted to grow their small enterprise of creating handmade leather vests for extra income. So they also needed to master technology some more. Um, but what made this program successful was that participants received that one-on-one -on -one support. Um, we had staff that were bilingual. Um, also, participants were linked to the resources they really need that we needed, and then given the space to ask questions and learn. Um, what is often, you know, ageism often overshadows providing support to seniors as they are viewed as not wanting to improve their their life skills. Um, but the success coaches found that, you know, when low, working with low income participants, um, is a lot of these participants actually came from our senior food box program, um, who were on average about eighty years old. Um, that the seniors still had dreams and desire to stay up to date with technology. Um, they were willing to be engaged and active and making changes and learning new information which is, you know, obviously great to see. Um, so as an organization that is moving towards, um, you know, more services online and becoming more tech savvy, we do think it's important to increase the investment in these needs and organizations that are working on these issues. Um, and that's all I have to say for today. And then I'll pass it to Laura. Thank you, Yesenia. Um, I do have a, a couple of questions because it was really, uh, I love hearing about the, the work with seniors. Um, and so in terms of the the numbers that have that were with you when you started and then the adoption as you've seen like word of mouth and and, and information on the program where are you seeing numbers right now are you seeing uh, a, a market increase um and in, in interest in the program our program actually ended um i would say last year unfortunately so we haven't continued with that program uh, we were hoping to find new grant money to help us continue with it. So unfortunately, we can't really speak to that right now. Okay. Um, would you say that you um, feel like there would be significant interest in continuing that program from the community that you are working with? 
Yes, definitely. And I think um, we probably didn't even reach our capacity that we could with, um, like I said, we have a lot of seniors that we service every month. um, And that was only a fraction that we even got to speak to or, you know, kind of connect with and do that outreach to even talk to them about the program. Fantastic program. And also love hearing, I I know that um, isolation during the pandemic for seniors was um, a a very significant issue. So being able to help them connect um, with their families and learn those digital skills is just amazing. So thank you so much for sharing. Okay, no problem. Okay, um, I am going to pivot to Rigo um, with the American GI Forum to talk about their digital literacy um, and inclusion programs and work um, in uh, your area. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Good morning, everyone. My name is Rigo Hernandez. I'm with the American GI Forum. Um, We have one of our directors uh, as well, uh, Helen Galvan. Um, This organization is a nonprofit organization and has uh, served our community uh, the um, our main uh, focus has been the low income, the elderly, the hard to reach population, the Mixteco speaking population, which is a trilingual. Uh, and we have uh, uh, served our community, our veterans as well. We're located located here in San Maria, California. Uh, and uh, within the last uh, five years, uh, we have start we started with uh, helping families sign up for the Internet Essentials Program, uh, which is a low cost uh, internet program for families. We started with 30, uh, uh, signing up about 30 families uh, per month. Right now we have been concentrating specifically with the Affordable Connectivity Program, the ACP program. And we're uh, working directly with uh, CETF. And we we are part of a, uh, an IVR where we receive phone calls for from families all over California, and we're doing 141 adoptions. We call them adoptions, which is ACP uh, uh, confirm adoptions. So we help our families to sign up for the up to $30 discount per month for their home internet or cell phone. So we've been uh, doing uh, our staff. We started as a, 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 a three uh, individuals, and now we're. Um, uh, now we're growing to have a big staff, which we has given us an opportunity to uh, to help a lot of our families, our local community. We do a uh, food bank as well. Uh, uh, every second Tuesday of the month where we give out uh, food to our local families, over 300 families every time we uh, do the event. And we, it gives us an opportunity to provide uh, uh, information in regards to ACP program and digital literacy as well. Uh, within the last two years, we were uh, working very hard to uh, during the pandemic to uh, help our families do digital literacy uh, online, uh, working with different districts throughout California. And we were able to do uh, help out more than 3,500 families uh, sign up for the digital literacy program. And we were we had a really uh, high success rate uh, with the digital uh, literacy program uh, uh, with school districts. Uh, with that said, uh, we are keep working with our community, uh, the hard to reach. Like I said uh, before, uh, some of the obstacles that we have found is uh, availability of uh, of uh, of uh, of service. Cost has been a big obstacle. Uh, language barrier has been another big obstacle, and uh, our organization has uh, uh, has helped our families, our local families, as well as other counties to sign up and uh, for the ACP program and be able to save up to thirty dollars per month for their home internet and cell phone service. Um, and that's it. I, I like how you kind of minimize that there at the end. That's that your guys are doing so much. I, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Rico at the Santa Maria um, event when we were doing our in person, and was just uh, really excited to hear about the work that that they were doing um, that uh, GI Forum was doing. So, I did have um, a couple follow up questions. So, you had mentioned when you do the food bank, which is just a, a fantastic way when to to reach community members that may not otherwise be be um, um, engaged and aware of like the affordable connectivity program. Um, 
just out of curiosity, when you're talking to people at these events about the Affordable Connectivity Program, how many are you seeing had even heard about it before? Oh, there's a, a large percentage of families that haven't heard about the ACP program or any help. And we have that opportunity to help them out. We help out our veterans as well. During the food bank events, we do have a, a percentage of people that showed up that are veterans and they don't have a clue about the ACP program or any other program. So we have the opportunity to share with them what we do and what, what else, what other services are available uh, for them at those different events. We do, uh, do, we do other community events such as swamp meets, and uh, we partnered out with other nonprofits as well to participate at other sites and give out information on what we do here at the office. So that gives us an opportunity not only to reach out uh, here at the office, but at other events as well. Our organization, I'm sorry, I didn't mention this, but our organization has, has been uh, uh, for more than 43 years uh, uh, available for our community. So we have done a lot of work. Uh, one of the another thing that I forgot to mention, I'm sorry, was that uh, uh, just uh, uh, last month uh, the organization gave out uh, gave out more than 43 scholarships to our youth uh, for higher education, and and that has been something uh, that we uh, appreciate very much because everything what we do is toward our community. Like I said, uh, we one of the main uh, goals uh, here at the office is try to help out as much as we can. We deliver more than 4,000 Chromebooks during the pandemic. Uh, some of those uh, deliveries were at home where we saw the, the reality and the need of those Chromebooks, but not only the Chromebooks, but the availability of uh, internet, Wi-Fi to the families. We saw a uh, first sight uh, what what's needed out there and we have uh, worked um, very hard to um, make a difference in our community, Laura. It sounds like you've made a tremendous difference. Um, and, and one thing that you touched on that was also kind of in our in our key takeaways was the importance of the, the in-language communications and, and uh, digital literacy training and, and, and stuff like that. And it sounds like that's a big focus of, of your organization specifically like in this on the Central Coast and within your community. Yes, uh, I'm trilingual. I speak Mixteco, which is a dialect and uh, has helped out a lot to really communicate in our community a uh, third language availability so uh, our families are aware of uh, the services that we provided uh, and that has given us a lot of uh, opportunities to help out. Fantastic work that you are doing at the American GI Forum. Thank you so much Rico for being here with us today. Thank you Laura. Uh, Andy with Bite Back San Francisco, you are up. Thank you, Laura. I do want to mention really quickly that we are actually in Sacramento. So oh, I'm so sorry. No, you're totally fine. Um, but thank you. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Urutia. I am the program coordinator for Bite Back. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Bite Back, uh, our mission is to close the digital divide by providing under-resourced communities an equitable pathway into the digital economy. And we achieve this through transformative digital advocacy, digital literacy, um, tech certification training. I, I do want to focus on one program that has been effective within the communities. Um, here at Bite Back, we have launched our 360 Digital Navigator program. Um, the 360 Digital Navigation program is a Bite Back community to community approach. Um, it's kind of train the trainee type of approach as well. Um, the digital literacy that provides customized support to individuals and families. Um, the program is designed to equip direct service workers with digital skills. Um, tools, resources that are necessary to support community members who have low digital skills um, with completing online tasks, gaining access to free or low cost internet and devices, and connect connecting to online resources. Um, we feel this is critical for their well being. So, Bypack's 360 Digital Navigator program has already made a significant impact in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, uh, Maryland. We actually opened the office here in Sacramento and also in Miami. Um, since its launch, the program has provided customized support to more than 400 scholars and their families in 2022. Um, we help them through gain essential digital skills and access technology as well. Um, we do feel that creating partnerships with our other community-based organizations is highly important. And so we encourage collaborations with local community centers, libraries, nonprofits, 
um, organizations that can help reach individuals and families who may not have easy access to technology. Um, these organizations can help providing training programs and resources to support digital skill development. Uh, we can collaborate with other nonprofits doing similar work as well uh, to design and implement effective programs and research innovative approaches as well to make sure that we bridge the digital divide. Um, state and local government agencies play a vital role, we feel like, um, in promoting digital inclusion. Uh, they can allocate funding for community technologies, uh, centers, and develop policies to ensure equitable access to technology and digital skills. Um, technology companies can offer valuable resources, we feel. And we lost your audio. We lost his audio. Can someone, can someone next, next to us? Mm -hmm. We can't can hear you. Hear you. Uh, can somebody, we should send a message. In the, in the, if the moderator can get a mute, you may be able to listen or mute. Uh, He's can I hear you? Andy, can you unmute? Your are your are out. out. So we, so we may need to come back to you. Okay, can you hear me now? I'm so sorry about that. No, we lost a, a good minute of what you were saying there, but we can hear you now. Oh, I'm so sorry about that, Laura. We it did not hear me at all. <laughs> no, it's okay. We were talking. Um, we were talking about the partnerships with with state agencies and reaching out, and then it just kind of got like, cut out right there. Oh, okay, of course. Thank you for putting me back where I yeah, was. Yeah, I was trying to give you a timeout or visual or something like that. So I'm sorry. It okay. like it shows me my face, so I just can't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem. Not okay, a problem. perfect. Um, I'm glad you guys can hear me now. But yes, we feel like state agencies uh, can definitely help us as well. Um, we feel that, you know, we can implement um, effective programs and research innovation approaches to bridge the digital divide. And like I mentioned, government agencies play a vital role in promoting digital inclusion. Uh, they can allocate funding, um, play, you know, they can also, you know, develop policies and ensure equitable access to technology and digital skills training technology companies as well. Um, this can offer I'm sorry, can you guys still hear me? It keeps saying that the video's visual's going out. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, they can also allocate funding for community technology centers and develop policies to ensure equitable access to technology and digital skill training. Uh, technology companies can offer valuable resources like donating devices. Uh, we do feel that it's important to establish inclusive and diverse partnerships that address uh, the specific needs um, of different community members and individuals by combining efforts and resources uh, these collaborations can help create more digitally empowered society, we feel like. Uh, we do encourage affordable internet plans and subsidized connectivity options for low-income individuals as well, families that can go and by promoting the ACP program. Uh, we actually implement the ACP program into our 360 digital navigation program. Um, I think it's also important to understand the barriers that come with certain programs like the ACP. Uh, one major issue that I've seen personally within the application is the social security question. Uh, we understand that not everyone has social security and so a social security number. Um, so this question tends to scare off many people. Um, and so members that would have eligibility already, when they see the question, they tend to kind of back up and not continue um, applying for the ACP. Uh, we also facilitate access to devices such as computer, laptop, tablets, and smartphones through device donation program, uh, low uh, cost options or device lending initiatives um, in libraries and community centers like Bike Back, I believe that more organizations should develop and implement digital literacy programs that cater to, to different age groups and skill levels. Uh, these programs should cover basic digital skills like online safety, using digital tools, um, accessing online resources. Organizations can offer trainings through community centers, libraries, schools, and other online platforms as well. Um, another recommendation would be to regularly assess the effectiveness of digital equity and strategies and make necessary adjustments based on the feedback from the community. Um, here at Bite Back, we constantly make sure that we get feedback from 
people taking our course, our trainings, and we implement those into um, future trainings as well. Um, but that's all I have. Um, I hope that the um, unmuting and muting didn't really throw anyone off. I'll shoot it back to you, Laura. No, I think I think we got it. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask a, a question about um, you, partnerships. So continually, you are mentioning partnerships. And I wonder if you can just talk a little bit more about um, not only just the value of those, because I think we heard that, but also really um, how, how a organization might go about making those partnerships and reaching out because I think sometimes we are we work in silos and we're kind of unaware of what's going on in the communities around us and so what's a good way for uh, a, a community-based organization to to engage in and uh, partner with others yeah definitely thank you I think we see it here at Bikeback as in communicating and partnering with other nonprofits that maybe be doing the same type of work but also other partnerships that can add value to what we're doing here. For example, um, you know, us doing an ACP event here at Bite Back, we have, you know, the education purpose already locked down, but we want to reach out to other nonprofits that can offer equipment, um, other nonprofits that can either offer a space, um, and together we can give the access, the support, um, the equipment to the communities. So just making sure that we partner with people that can actually add value to what we're doing and move the initiative forward and, you know, make sure that we bridge that digital divide. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us today and sharing what you're working on there at Bite Back in Sacramento. Yes. Thank you so much, Laura. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, Arlene. Um, would love to hear from you about loaves, fishes, and computers. Thank you. Um, the comments from each of the previous presenters give very good advice about how to implement digital equity and inclusion in your communities. Loves, Fishes, and Computers has been working in this arena since 2009, and I've been involved with it since 2011. Um, we refurbish computers and we offer these at low to no cost to recipients and thus far have distributed over 13,000 computers to low income community members in Monterey County. We get money for that through the sales of computers, but mostly through grants and contracts, which I'll describe in a few minutes. We've also side by side developed an extensive digital literacy curriculum that moves people through basic to intermediate skills. Basic skills range from everything to turning on your computer to establishing email to um, learning how to use the internet and then more advanced curriculum goes into internet safety and digital citizenship. Digital citizenship significantly focused on um, misinformation and disinformation and how to check sources because there is so much of that uh, virulent communications on the internet these days that we want to make people aware of the pervasiveness of propaganda. Um, one of the uh, programs that we've established, which directs uh, to what Yesenia was talking about and uh, the other two presenters is uh, something that I began in 2021 called Connecting Seniors with Technology. Funding for this came through what every one of the participants in this uh, webinar, the Zoom meeting has, which is through the uh, county's area agency on aging. Every county has an area agency on aging through its Department of Social Services. And ours here in Monterey County reached out to us during the height of the pandemic, noting the emotional stress and isolation of seniors. And since then, since 2021, we have trained over 240 seniors. We have given them tablets and iPads this training requires individual and small group training sessions. Each senior requires somewhere between three and five sessions to gain basic skills and what they consider more advanced, downloading files, sending photographs, logging on to Zoom, uh, FaceTime, et cetera. It's one of our most extensive and exciting programs. And as we each know, there's enormous need for that. We get contracts 
One of the ways that you can increase your um, outreach, um, Andy was speaking about this collaboration. We have contracts with local school districts in which we train the parents of our school children how to use a Chromebook, which is the most pervasive advice, a device in the schools. We take them through um, uh, cohorts of learners, generally 20 adults, they go through eight to nine weeks of training of two sessions per week. Uh, those sessions range about two hours in length. Uh, we start them out on site. We move them to a hybrid or virtual training. And uh, now we're even starting for all of these seniors that we have trained. We have provided over 850 digital literacy courses for all of these seniors. We're moving them into more advanced um, internet and computing skills, and we try to get them to collaborate with one another. We reach out through what has been mentioned. We promote our services through Meals on Wheels, through the Alliance on Aging, through the public libraries, through nonprofit community-based organizations, through small business associations, uh, through unique, uh, through the County Office of Ed, we've done a lot of training of migrant youth. In other words, we tried to be as extensive in our reach and as inclusive of community members as possible. We have now um, working on some new initiatives with workshops. So over the years, we developed a parent and child workshop in which we taught a parent and a child how to refurbish a Chromebook, which we then gave them to take home. We got that funded through local uh, funding agencies. So the parent and child start off together. They refurbish a Chromebook or a laptop. We do a lot of it pre before they get there so that in an hour, hour and a half, they feel a sense of accomplishment and can take home their computing device. The children then go off and learn some other, more uh, other stuff. And we take the parents and we get them an email account. We try to get them a library card. We teach them how to log on to their school's portal. When the children come back to the workshop, we uh, put them on a digital scavenger hunt to find and bookmark appropriate sites that help them identify and access resources that are meaningful to them. What we are about to embark on, another new project which opens up other funding um, opportunities for your organizations is um, what I'm calling Together and Connected with STEAM or accentuating the A in STEAM. I've written two grant applications with those titles. As you know, STEM is the big buzzword in education, science, technology, engineering, and math. But for those of us with humanities and arts backgrounds and preferences, we added the A, science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math. And the grant applications I've recently submitted, which we will be starting uh, in the next few months is together and connected STEAM workshops in which for the first part of the workshop, this will include parents who have been trained by us in our digital literacy classes and have a computing device, a parent and child or a grandparent now that has a tablet and child will come together and we will teach them the more advanced skills of digital um, of internet safety and digital citizenship. Arlene, that's the is first part of the workshop. Thank you so much for. I'm sharing. going to just finish that. The second okay. part of the workshop with arts, opening up arts opportunities for funding, is they will take recycled computer parts and start to create a work of art from that a mobile, a, an assemblage art, a collage. In this way, they have a bonding experience, but they also have an extremely unique learning experience. All of our materials, including these internet safety guides are available at lowesfishescomputers.org. Thank you, Laura, sorry.
Oh, no, no. Thank, Thank you so much. I, I love hearing you guys have so much um, that, that you're focusing on. And again, I had the, the pleasure of uh, hearing Arlene speak when we were at Seaside. So Arlene, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm going to ask all of the speakers, um, there's a tremendous amount of interest in the chat um, for contact information. Um, if you would please share your contact information in the chat so folks can reach out to you about the programs that you've shared here today. Scott, did you have a couple comments? Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks to all the um, all the panelists and partners that came today and throughout the, the workshop. There's um, such great work being out there. And I wanted to, to point out that this is such a great convergence of the digital planning process and how we're you know bringing in folks that we met at the in-person regional planning workshops to be a part of the um, virtual you know digital equity inclusion working group. And I think everyone that is here today is someone that we um, are an organization that we met out there. Um, I think a couple key takeaways is just how important CBOs are to doing the work um, locally of, of digital equity and inclusion. And um, an interesting point that, that many folks are not um, sort of single issue organizations, but you're multiple service and you're weaving in digital equity um, into your other programs. And um, I think, you know, what all of you have reinforced is the importance of, um, you know, not just access, but the um, uh, affordability and adoption. And so getting people, you know, access to ACP, to the devices, and then on the training side, um, you know, needs-based training that caters to folks, you know, across the spectrum, because we're really focusing on the covered populations. Um, and then Rigo, I just have to say it was so fun meeting you because we've heard over and over about the need to, um, you know, to meet people where they are and to communicate to them in language and cultural competence. And one of the things that we've heard about is that there are these other dialects. And so hearing from folks in Santa Maria, um, and up in Seaside about the Mesteco population and the work that you guys are doing, that is just um, really an example that, that we should <laughs> carry out. I mean, as we pull together all this information um, or input and feedback to develop the state digital equity plan, I want to remind folks that there is going to be digital equity capacity dollars, potentially, you know, a hundred million to help all of us implement this plan we're working on together. And that um, where it's different from the infrastructure money, it's going to be specifically for potential eligible uses of developing broadband adoption um, programs, ACP outreach programs, you know, um, standardized or shareable um, digital literacy training programs, um, potentially device distribution programs. We've heard from Arlene and others um, about the importance of uh, getting devices out there. So um, just really thank everyone for um, bringing your subject matter expertise here and teeing up the community conversation. I do want to share, we've heard that there's um, collaboration, coordination, partnership. Um, that is what um, we've heard from the communities and that um, from the state level to the regional to the local level, we all benefit from working together and knowing about our work and, you know, potentially not duplicating um, those efforts. And it was mentioned on the, um, on the education working group yesterday, creating a structure or keeping in place the structures that have been developed for the digital equity planning group, like, um, or the planning process. So we have this um, 22 members statewide digital equity planning group and these six working groups that even once the plan is developed and the capacity dollars are there that we keep together a much larger statewide community of practice so that we're sharing resources and best practices to get to the end goal. So um, Laura, thanks for a little bit of time. Um, I hope I didn't talk too much, but kicking it back to you. Thank you, Scott. Um, now is when we're going to move into the community discussion. So this is when we want to hear from you. So if we can bring up the, the slide that has the prompts, that would be fantastic. Next slide. 
Okay, so um, here's when we are going to ask you to use the raise hand function so that we can see that you would like to um, provide some feedback or, or comments. Um, the uh, topics that we have today are, um, who are the most effective and trusted messengers in the digital literacy and inclusion space? Um, and this can be anything. I think we heard yesterday Scott mentioned the education outcome area working group that we had. Um, uh, we had folks mentioning more non-traditional um, trusted messengers. Um, and then what are some strategies or programs that have effectively addressed digital equity barriers? So um, please don't be shy. Raise your hand. Um, we would love to hear from you. So we're going to go ahead and start with Gina. Hi, Gina. Are you able? There you go. Thank you so much. Um, OK, I didn't see this in any of the other uh, Zoom meetings that you had, but this is very specific to digital literacy. Um, and I had written in about grants for digital literacy. Right now, one of the biggest ones that we have found have, have been the CASIB grants, which are awesome. Um, and um, I'm also part of the San Jose Digital Inclusion Partnership in San Jose. So I'm seeing a little bit of, um, I'm seeing a little bit of creativity that is needed. Right now, it seems like CASIB is like, you gotta do eight hours and that's it. And you better clock it if you wanna get paid. And with San Jose Digital Inclusion Partnership, it's six hours, and if they need the six hours, then it's got to be six hours. And um, just coming from the background of training online for many years with over tens of thousands of students, I just think that that's a bad idea. We need to step away from that seat time, and we need to look at proficiency um, and be more creative. So I just wanted to put it out there, whomever is dealing with creating those regulations, on digital literacy, uh, let's really look at proficiency and step away from seat time. That's kind of, that's old training. We don't. That's not how it's done anymore. Um, let's be progressive. Help people where they're at. Some people um, are only going to want to learn so much and can only learn so much, and it's unfair to them to think that they're going to be able to do six or eight hours. Then there are those who are just really advanced. Give us the opportunity to push it and teach them even more. So seat time according to the individual's needs is what I'm asking um, to be part of, of the mission here. Let's be smart about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. And also just wanna remind those of you um, who are here in the audience, if you want to respond back to something that you heard, um, I would encourage you to raise your hand and do so. It's great to do it in the chat, but we would also love to hear from you. Um, Pat, we're gonna go to you next. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, great. So um, I did, oh, I didn't, I tried to start my video, it's not working. Okay, right, here we go. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for all the information. It's it's great to hear some great ideas coming from this. Um, I, I think one of the things that uh, we can also um, look into addressing is um, for our organization, we've had a lot of feedback on um, learners looking for um, resources for either lower cost devices or free devices. We had a lot of those requests. Um, so a way to share where those resources are um, is would be great. Um, and then Gina, you had mentioned something about a, a grant that's available. You cut out. Um, if you can share that information again, either through chat or something, that would be wonderful. And I, I agree with you on the um, putting up the pro setting up the programs where it's not a set amount of time of giving digital literacy classes, but identifying the proficiencies and meeting them, meeting the learners of where their needs are is um, a good idea. We are constantly trying to figure out how to do that. Um, so if you have, if you want to share your ideas, that'd be great. Um, and on the other side uh, of 
learning how the learners are proficient, coming up with uh, ideas for reporting on um, how their proficiencies are, how the impact is for us. Um, we're working on that as well, especially me as a uh, data control and quality manager. Um, I think that would be good to have, um, especially with like all the California programs and understanding how much impact we're making with um, the resources that we're receiving. Thank you so much, Pat. We appreciate that. And I believe um, what um, was mentioned early were, earlier was the California Advanced Services Fund. It's a CPUC, California Public Utilities Commission program. Um, Keith, you are up. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm definitely picking up on the thread of partnership, collaboration, and um, pulling together CBOs with, that are complementary to one another. Um, someone put in the chat, you know, not comp not competing, but complementing one another. And I was wondering if one or more of the panelists would speak on like what they thought was a key ingredient, key ingredient to one of their successful collaborations and partnerships. Thank you, Keith. That's a great question. And I want to extend the, the, that question to both our panelists as well as our co-chairs for this group, because I know, um, Juliana, I saw you um, in active there in chat, and I do know that um, you have quite a few programs that um, do collaborate. So um, go for it. I see you got your hand up. Okay, I'll put my hand down in just a second. Um, hi everyone, my name is Juliana and I am a library programs consultant. I work for the California State Library. I live in Long Beach and um, I just did want to share a little bit um, about a reminder to please don't forget to include your local public library, which is most likely a city or county government jurisdiction that operates independently. However, we at the State Library help coordinate grants and training and funding, and we can communicate with them, but they are all independent and all each a little bit different. Um, every public library has public access computers. They do um, checkouts of Wi-Fi and hotspot. We have a statewide digital navigators program that's a team of all remote English and Spanish speaking digital navigators who can help on everything from low or no cost devices, helping people sign up for ACP, navigate issues that they might have with that sign up, or get more information about digital skills training, either through local community based organizations like many of you here, or through the local public library. Uh, many, if not all, libraries also have local literacy services that some are in bi bilingual also, and um, a lot of them have access to a free digital literacy tool that the state library has provided called North Star. Um, we can track and see what learners are doing on there, so that's some of the most exciting things to me, as we can see at the beginning that most learners will take an assessment and get a pass rate of about 30%, um, but we'll see the pass rates increase as they take more assessments and do more follow-up training. So to me, as a former teacher and educator myself, that's very exciting. Um, and then I will also just mention one more thing, um, that libraries often also have a um, variety of different online resources that users can use 24-7 from their house. They don't have to be in a library. They don't have to be available during normal business hours to access um, all sorts of workforce and upskilling platforms um, that are available free with a library card to anyone in California. And if anyone has any questions or wants to talk more about collaborating, I love to see our partners here, Department of Aging, awesome. Department of Technology, also awesome. Um, we love to partner and um, hear all about the work that's going on in communities across California. So I'll pop that in chat, thanks. Thanks, Juliana. Um, and yeah, if you can put those in chat, especially like the Digital Navigator Program, which is at, um, uh, I think you're at 58 library jurisdictions across California. Um, those of you who are attending here can check to see if um, yours is one of them that is participating. Um, Arlene, um, I would love to hear from you. Um, Keith's question was, what's that magic ingredient on partnering with organizations um, on a common goal? Are 
Um, Thank you. Um, you know, it, one of the ways to approach this is to go to an organization, target their population and speak to the executive directors or people in charge and say, here is what we can offer. Who of your constituency needs these skills? And of course, before you approach them, you know that they have constituents that need your skills. This can result in collaborations for contracts and or grant applications. So for example, some I love the libraries and the schools and the school districts and non, other nonprofits, but think outside the box. We went to the ag industry. We went to a small uh, nonprofit, um, a small business enterprise called Alba, which is training local farmers how to do organic farming. And yet they needed to learn business skills. And so we approached them when they approached us and we created a collaboration and we're now training these farmers in digital literacy um, skills. This breaks through the barriers. When I describe the digital divide, I describe it as an economic divide, a racial divide, a geographic divide, a gender divide, an age divide, a social justice divide, an economic and a technology divide. If you think that broadly, if you think about all the organizations and businesses in your communities that that definition addresses, that opens other doors for you for funding applications and for contracts. I can't overemphasize how important it is for a nonprofit to develop a contractual relationship with um, organizations and businesses in your communities. And finally, uh, word of mouth. We During the pandemic, people were lined up outside our doors, like Arigo's organization with GIs. We gave out in one year over 3,000 Chromebooks, which we desperately were refurbishing. We got a large supply of Chromebooks that were outdated from the local school district. 80% of them, let's say, were usable, could be refurbished. We had our we were limited, volunteers couldn't come because of lockdown, but we set our minds to it and we refurbished. And even last year, 2022, we distributed over uh, 1,200 computers into the community. So um, I guess my answer to all of that is think imaginatively, think collaboratively, think outside of the box and use your people, your staff, your uh, collaborate, your partners, and most importantly, the people who you are helping to be your best advocates. Thank you, Arlene. Thank you for summarizing that so succinctly as well. Um, and I'm seeing lots of lots of agreement in chat into, is for what you're saying. I just um, wanted to say that Gina's comment, I forgot, about proficiency versus time in the seat is right on target. And there are across the internet, like the National Digital Inclusion Association, et cetera, you can find worksheets on digital literacy skills, et cetera. And um, that would be a, a much better way than time in the seat. Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, Lisa Miller, um, and if you're comfortable, if you can let us know um, if you're um, speaking on behalf of yourself or an organization, um, that would be great. Oh, sh sure. Um, I'm speaking as, let me see if I can get my video to work here. Um, working. I'm working at home, I apologize. There we go. Um, I am speaking as a professor at University of California, Davis. So I, I, that's pretty much myself and the organization. Um, and I'm a big believer in trying to um, leverage the amazing potential of the students, um, uh, college students in our state and trying to, um, you know, optimize how we can connect them to um, individuals who are in need. So specifically, I've been working on um, pairing um, undergraduates with low income seniors to work across the quarter on digital literacy training. So it's one on one. And for me, the secret sauce or the, where the trust comes in, which is really, really important, is in the relationship that develops between the student and the older adult. It happens organically. It's, it's really a marvelous thing to see. 
and um, and it works. The training is is quite um, impressive. So I've just started. In other words, how much they've learned in terms of technology use is, is you can demonstrate. So I just want to put that out there. It, it has its its challenges because of the multiple payer system, if you will. Right, there's a lot of you have nonprofits involved um, to help recruit the older adults. In location like a senior center or a library is important, but also you know getting the universities and and the um, the colleges to to go along with this. That this is something that um, teaches. Is, is, an, is an amazing teacher. Um, it, I'm call, this is called you know, community engaged learning and there's a big push for this. And it, the students are really, really impressed by how much they learn about aging and reaching out to the community and about all kinds of divides <laughs> um, and inclusion. So I'm just putting that out there as, a, as a, um, another way to go about this. And I have a, a link to our local newspaper um, for more information on that. I'll just put it in the chat. Thank you, Lisa. Really appreciate that feedback. Very insightful. Um, Scott Adams, California Department of Technology, you have your hand up. Yeah, Laura. Um, so I just wanted to comment on um, both what Arlene said about peer-to-peer -peer and what Lisa just said about intergenerational. Um, you know, those are themes that we have heard throughout the working groups and also in the workshops that in terms of really um, getting over those digital equity barriers that, you know, there's the organizational and structural support that is needed, but the um, effectiveness of that peer-to-peer -peer model that as peers get trained, they go out and train others, or as peers learn about, you know, individuals learn about ACP and get connected, that they go share that with their community. So that's definitely um, something, um, Arlene, that, that we're underscoring that we've heard as a recommended strategy. And Lisa, um, the the intergenerational um, component is something that we've heard across the outcome areas, um, whether it's, um, you know, youth and parents or grandchildren and um, grandparents or older veterans, um, you know, uh, potentially being taught digital literacy skills um, by younger veterans. Those are two really um, cool themes. And so I'm glad that you guys brought them into this final workshop to underscore those because there is a lot of complexity. I mean, going back to what Lisa said, the organizations, you know, you've got um, the Fed, this multiple state agencies that are working on these multiple regional and um, local agencies, like how we navigate this um, is going to be um, really important in how we develop programs and allocate capacity grants to do that. The one other thing that I wanted to, to point out is it feels to me that like a lot of this is about digital navigation and where California is slightly different than other states is that as we're putting together our digital equity plan, um, the NTIA would like all states, I think, to be looking at digital navigation. Um, there was actually legislation passed at the end of last year by assembly member um, Mia Bonta um, that um, specifically asks the state to look at, um, do an inventory of all the digital navigation programs um, across the state and um, develop recommendations on how to implement that. Um, you know, a, a program, either a centralized digital navigator program or a grant program that empowers digital navigators. And we've seen, you've got, you know, uh, Julianne and the California State Library is as a central, you know, convening entity working with the um, the county and the, the branch libraries. Um, I think Arlene mentioned the Department of Aging, Brian Carter's here. Um, they work very closely with the um, AAAs um, to implement the chat, the AT&T program, um, critical in getting those iPads and devices out. So. Um, just really inspired by um, everything that folks have pointed out. And it's such a complex thing that we're glad we've had all of your expertise to provide input and guidance. Thank you, Scott. Robert Osborne with the California Public Utilities Commission, you've got your hand up as well. Hi, thank you. And I apologize for being late, um, but um, 
want to thank the Department of Technology for hosting this important event and giving us an opportunity at the PUC to share a little bit about the uh, adoption account that was mentioned earlier. So the California Advanced Services Fund adoption account came into being back in 2017 with AB 1665 and rules were created. We created rules back in 2018. To date, we've had, I think we've awarded 280 projects um, to provide digital literacy to about 60,000 people. Um, I think the comments that Gina made earlier are spot on. Um, the rules that we have right now are looking at um, something that's verifiable. The eight hours is part of the guidelines right now. And I would encourage anyone who is interested in this topic to participate in the rulemaking so that we can make changes to the program because we are driven by what's in the public record. So um, that would certainly help us in terms of um, helping the program evolve to adapt to sort of the realities on the ground. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. And did you put the rule banking in there? I think I saw a link from in there at one point. I didn't, but I will do that. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, oh, I was just going to say, and Rob, um, if you send that to our team and the thank you after this, we'll um, include critical links out to everyone um, on this call. Thank you everyone for your comments today. We really appreciate hearing from you. Um, and I think we're going to go ahead and move forward to uh, talking a little bit about the, the surveys that we have um, that are out there for um, input. And so I'm going to turn things over to Sean Doherty with the um, Broadband Equity Partnership to go over those. Sean. Hey, Laura, real quick. I know that um, typically we, uh, have been moving along. I think Miriam got one last hand up. Can we? Um, sure. Can we get a Miriam? Thank you. As the final question before we move on. Yeah, so I wanted to know uh, whether the state, I guess this is a question for Laura, but anybody, <clears throat> anybody who has the answer, uh, can provide it. I wanted to know if the state's uh, program to provide uh, access to broadband and uh, more generally uh, to technology uh, includes some strategy for uh, getting people to teach all these things to individuals and groups and communities around the state. Yeah, Miriam, I'll take that one. Um, the state's overall broadband for all program is um, focused on, on basically three main goals, which is getting people access to reliable high-speed internet, um, access to um, affordable home internet and devices and the training and the skills that they need. Um, I think you've heard Rob Osborne and our folks um, at the PUC talk about the, um, the uh, California Advanced Services Fund broadband adoption program, which is funded some digital literacy work. And then you've heard from a bunch of folks here today who are doing that work out in the community, like you know, the American GI Forum, Loves mm -hmm. Fishes and Computers. So a lot of that's been um, done. You know, California Emerging Technology Fund and their many grantees are doing that work. And so um, what um, the this process is intended now to do with the state digital equity plan is call all of the work together, identify all of the gaps and all of the needs based on citizen and organizational support, and then develop a digital equity program that will be funded. And part of what that will fund is how do we address the need to um, you know, support more training throughout the state for the very covered population. So I hope that answered it. And it's a really good segue to the final um, two portions of the agenda. Yes, thank you very much. You bet. All right, thank you. Let's move along to Sean. Sean, you're back up. Um, let's talk about the Digital Equity Survey and DEAM Survey. Thank you. Thank, 
Thanks, Lara. I'm Sean Doherty with the Digital with the Broadband Equity Partnership. I'm thrilled to be able to talk about um, two additional ways that we are continuing to gather information and data on the excellent programs um, uh, that are happening across the state of California. I'm going to focus first on the Digital Equity Survey, then talk about the um, the Deem tools that we have, the toolkits, and then actually demo them. So. Um, it'll be good to uh, see how these actually work in action. So next slide, please. So the digital equity online survey is, um, we hope will be completed by um, uh, almost every household in the state of California. Um, we have 40, 40 uh, million people living here. So we want to hear from as many of those people as possible. So Arlene, we'd love to hear from all 13,000 recipients of your devices and Andy, all of the digital learners and um, you know, the individuals who trained the trainers um, about their um, their broadband experience in the state of California. Um, the digital um, online survey um, is mobile friendly. So if anyone scans that QR code that we have here, um, it'll pop up and is very easy to see on a device. So um, Regio, maybe next time you have um, a food bank, you have that QR code sitting right there and people can take it while they wait in line for their food. Um, we um, also have it developed in 14 different languages, which has been really successful and I think just um, acknowledges um, the accessibility um, and the concerns that we took of the communities in developing this online survey. There's also a built-in audio functionality, which I'll demonstrate. And so all of those 14 languages, you can either read the text or have the text read aloud to you, which has been really useful for people who have um, uh, maybe limited literacy or um, are um, have um, uh, visual impairments. Um, this helps them complete the survey as well. So again, we're encouraging you to send this out to all of your networks, to everybody that you have engaged with through your programs, through your partnerships, through your collaboratives, and that's really our call to action. Um, we're hoping for a minimum of 10,000. Um, we, we're um, a good way there, and I think that's a good segment to the next slide, actually. So you can see some of the results that we've had in the roughly uh, three weeks or so um, since the uh, survey has been open. We have had over 4,500 responses. This is the distribution um, by county. Um, you can, um, we are really impressed um, to see uh, some maybe more rural counties such as Imperial or Inyo um, really pulling ahead to compete with the uh, LA's and the San Francisco's. But if you see your county there um, and you see maybe the numbers are a little lower, think about who you work with, think about who you partner with, think about the, the religious organizations you work with, the CBOs, the nonprofits, the community health centers, the libraries. Absolutely agree with you on that, Juliana. Um, who are all those organizations doing work that you can share with that you can send it out to their networks to make sure they are working with their communities. So this is, you know, again, the, the public survey. This is for individuals and households. I hope everybody on this call has completed it or will complete it. Um, it took me seven minutes. Um, it says 10 to 15, but it, in truth, I think it takes a lot less. Um, and so that's just kind of the top level of the digital equity. Scott, anything to add to that? Any comments you wanted to make? Oh, I'm sorry, but there's actually one more slide. We have a lot of really good data. Apologies. And as we mentioned, there was, um, you know, over 4,500 respondents. And I think this data really shows um, that it is getting to populations that we want to hear from. 54% um, of, of those who have completed it have been within minority communities, 41% within, you know, aging or older adult communities. These are the people we want to hear from, and these are the communities you've served. Um, you know, uh, uh, I think Yusina mentioned her program with seniors. Um, and so, um, we, we are really leaning on you and hoping that you will share this with um, the individuals in your community. It's, it's a necessary data that we're collecting right now. And as I mentioned you know, earlier, there's 14 languages. Here it's showing the use of those languages. 13 of those 14 have been utilized. And we're you know, really proud of all the work that went into that. And so we're seeing you know, uh, 76 or 78 roughly with English followed by Chinese and Spanish. Um, so a lot of languages are being utilized um, and um, and we hope that'll just continue. Yeah. And so, Sean, thank you. And folks, we know we've asked a lot of you um, in your time, but really um, the, the, what we want to reinforce here is that we've um, put a lot of time into developing a statewide um, survey that can be as accessible as possible. So in the language with the other accessibility features, um, the good news is that um, it works. You know, Yesenia, you mentioned at the top that um, there are just some folks that a paper survey 
would work. But what we were trying to demonstrate here is that um, is that we are getting um, a ton of response from the covered populations that um, we are intended to, um, you know, we're being directed to to focus on, and that folks are responding in their um, languages as well. So would really ask. We know you're a lot of movers and shakers. Um, you, you have direct connection to um, residents and individuals. That if you could please utilize. Um, the survey and promote it widely throughout your communities. We do have um, an outreach toolkit that has materials, you know, pre-drafted messages translated into languages and different social media assets um, in a variety of languages as well. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm going to review um, the the um, the organizational digital equity ecosystem mapping tool next. Give you some highlights. So if we can move on to the next slide. Actually, Sean, just real quick, um, before we move on, um, because there is a call to action for yeah. folks, um, has anyone, um, I'm just wondering, are there any questions about like, yeah. um, or, or any responses back from us? What would folks need from us to help promote the survey widely in your community? Hmm. And as Scott mentioned, there's an awesome toolkit with social media, printouts, the QR codes, bit.ly links, um, you know, but please, if there's anything more that we can create to be um, responsive to your community, please let us know. Yeah, and please contact us directly. Oh, Ingrid's got a hand up. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Ingrid Greenberg. I'm the online faculty mentor coordinator at San Diego College of Continuing Education. It's great to be here. Thank you for hosting. Um, a recommendation for our digital literacy students is some kind of a lesson plan to orient students to this survey. Um, it, there's a lot of questions and some of our students are new to surveys like this. Um, and like, why am I doing this? Why am I filling this out? And um, some kind of a, uh, a lesson that an so an ESL instructor, English as a second language instructor, or a digital navigator um, could present. Um, so that's one idea to promote, especially in an educational setting or a digital navigator library setting. Got it. And so Ingrid, thanks for calling that out. We did provide a toolkit in the um, uh, in the chat, and we'll send it out to folks. In the toolkit is um, an outreach guide for partners that kind of talks um, some about that. And there is a paper version of the survey um, so that folks who are promoting it can um, go through and look and see what is actually included in there and to help facilitate some of that. Um, so those resources are available. And by any chance, I know this is a long shot, but by any chance, um, are those orientation materials um, designed for Canvas learning management system because some of us teach fully online English as a second language course in a level one beginning literacy level. And um, for example, I teach using Canvas, the learning management system. And you may or may not know there's these modules, yeah. uh, Canvas pages, and we're looking for lessons that we could copy paste into the Canvas pages um, that help orient our students before we launch a survey like this. Oh, got it, Ingrid. Okay, so I think there's two things. Um, one is that the digital equity survey that we're asking folks to promote now is gonna be open. It's been open for about three weeks and it closes on June 30th. And so, um, really the resources we have are the resources we have. And there's a real call to action because we have to put together a draft digital equity plan um, sometime by July and then put it back out to public comment. Um, we may reopen it. So we'll, um, we'll you know, keep in mind the request about the LMS um, programs and potentially have a follow-up conversation with you as a subject matter um, 
expert. So yeah, Julie, and I, the survey closes on June 30th. Um, so there's this immediate call to action. And then mm -hmm. I think it's a go forward, both as part of the digital equity plan. And, you know, we may want to roll this survey out on a on an annual basis. We can then think more oh. long term about how we can support that. Um, but I wanted to um, um, kick it back over to Sean because she um, has another uh, piece that she needs to talk to folks about. Okay, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thanks, Ingrid. So yeah, moving on to the digital equity ecosystem mapping. Um, so um, you can actually move to the next slide. Thanks, Fiona. So this is for your organizations to complete. Um, we are looking to learn about, uh, as, as Jeff Bueller said yesterday, all of the, um, the pockets of excellence in the state um, and all of the organizations that are doing good work. So all of the organizations on this call, and I know there's been a lot of conversation around partnerships and, um, and collaboration and, um, and who you um, work with in your community and other CBOs and other organizations. Um, this is who we want to hear from in completing this tool. Um, we want to hear about their barriers. We want to hear about the program success and the needs. Um, but all of the information gathered um, through this process will um, go into our state digital equity plan that, uh, as Scott mentioned, um, will be uh, produced um, by the end of this year. Um, and the more information we have from your programs and how successful they've been in the needs and um, what we should, you know, uh, look towards as best examples um, will only make that plan stronger. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? Because the DEEM tool has been out for a little bit. Um, we have about 200 or about coming up on 300 responses. And as you can see, this is a bit of a heat map. Um, that shows the breakdown by county of where we're hearing from programs. Um, we want to get a respondent from at least every county. We know that there are programs operating in every county. Um, one is, I think, our, 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 our floor. Um, um, everyone is our, our ceiling. So, um, you know, we... Um, we want to hear from you. We want to hear from the partners that you work with. Um, we want to hear about all the good work they're doing and um, and hopefully um, uh, just see more and more responses to this and learn more and more uh, information. Next slide, please. Hey, Sean, can I just make a, um, a quick comment on this? Because we've talked about, um, we want to make sure that folks know that, that um, with all the information and data that we gather through the digital equity planning process. We also want to um, put that to use for the community so that we're not just using it for the digital equity plan, but we're using it um, for implementation of um, the digital equity plan and to support communities. So when we're talking about coordination and collaboration and being able to find people and bring them together, aside from you know um, continuing the community of practice in these working groups, the information that we gain from the um, digital equity ecosystem mapping tool, um, you know, we'd, we'd really like to put together some kind of a, a virtual visualization or index by county or city where um, folks who are doing similar work can find each other and that residents who are looking for services or support um, can find it on the Broadband for All portal. Um, so it's the, this is, an absolutely um, critical step in planning and putting together the digital equity plan, but also in helping with the implementation. Couldn't agree more, Scott. Um, so yes, reach out to your colleagues, reach out to your friends, um, reach out to your organizational partners. Um, next slide, please, Fiona. And this is kind of a, a breakdown of one of the questions that is asked um, in uh, the survey in the in the in the DEEM tool is just to kind of identify um, um, how you would identify your organization. Are you a government or a public organization? And this just kind of gives a kind of a, a brief breakdown of um, of how many we've heard from so far. So, you know, 19 city governments, there's well more than 19 city governments that exist in, in California. So I think that's just a little bit of, of evidence of, of where we have to go and where we want to hear from. Um, and next slide, please. 
And as I mentioned at the beginning of, 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 of kind of my, my section here, there's a wonderful toolkit. Um, the links are there, um, the bit.ly links to, um, and we're gonna we're gonna demo this in a second. Um, but again, it has all of the survey materials written out. It has all the social media um, materials so you can easily share it to your LinkedIn, to your Instagram, to your uh, Twitter, to um, whatever community or government pages you have. It has um, text that is, um, easily readable. And so we really encourage you to use the items that are within that toolkit. And if something else would be useful, please reach out to the team um, and um, happy to um, explore creating more. Next slide. Or is that the last one? And we are going to move on to the demo. Yeah. Can we bring up the demonstration, please? And we're going to start with the public survey. Awesome. So as you can see, it's it's clean, it's easy to read. Right there on that front page is where you're able to access all 14 of those languages. It defaults to English, um, but if you just click on any of those languages or toggle up at the corner, it is reactive, and so it automatically changes. And this is both whether you're doing it on a computer screen or whether you're doing it on a handheld uh, device, a smartphone, or, or what have you. You'll see down in the corner, there's actually an audio button that has a little play. So I don't know if it'll if the audio will play, but let's give it a go. Perfect. Thank you, Fiona. So you, you can see that all of those 14 languages, we have them both written and audio. They've been translated into both. Um, and so, uh, Fiona, do you mind going back to uh, just the English version for a second and moving on to the next slide? And hitting the next, next button. Um, this is the the one required question, are you 18 or do you reside in California? Everything else is wonderful information, um, but this is kind of, uh, um, I, I get not, not required. Um, you have to be over 18. You have to be a resident of California in order to complete the survey, excuse me. And again, you can see at the bottom that, that it's translated, um, both you have that audio function. So every single question going through, I don't know if you want to um, click and see all of those questions can be read out loud. What is your zip code? And then, you know, helps us to identify are these people responding from covered populations? Um, you know, what are their barriers to having um, broadband? Is it cost? Is it um, digital literacy and skills? Is it not having a device? And so that's really going to help us determine what the needs are from the community and just make this digital equity plan uh, that much stronger longer with that information from the individuals in the households. Uh, um, any questions on that, Scott? Anything to add um, before we go on to demo the DEEM tool? The only thing that I would want to add is that um, while we're looking at the functionality on a computer, um, if folks were to send an email or a text um, that was received on a mobile phone, um, it's th this survey is optimized to be completed on a mobile phone too. So um, you don't need a computing device um, to do that. Wonderful, wonderful. And do we wanna move on to the DEEM tool now, Fiona? Awesome, so this is the digital equity ecosystem map. This is the tool, as you can see, it's very clean as well. This is offered in English and Spanish and you can translate it via the toggle up at the corner as well. And again, this is for the organizations. Um, um, it takes about 10 minutes. I would encourage you all to look at the toolkit beforehand um, before completing this. There is actually um, a document, and maybe we want to go to that, under the DEEM survey instructions. Um, that actually has all the questions laid out. Um, so you can go in there prepared to just input all of that data and all that information. It asks, you know, the demographic questions um, around, you know, where you're located, who you serve, what programs do you have? And so as you can see, section three is around computer and device access. So if you do a device refurbishment or distribution program, you're going to want to have that information before going in there. This is a wonderful, helpful guide that will allow us to capture the most information possible. Um, and then on the last page of that um, of the um, of the tool, um, it also allows you to upload additional information. If you have white papers, if you have annual reports, if you have uh, grant reports or anything that speaks to the success of your program, please add them. That is just additional data and information that will um, that'll be extremely helpful um, to the team and to the organization. So 
Um, again, we're asking you on an organizational level to complete this, to share this with your other partners um, in the community, to share the links to the toolkit to, that will just um, make it a lot easier in implementing and using. And, um, and thank you for your participation. Um, I, I'm open for any questions, or if not, Laura, I can turn it back over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Sean. Thanks so much for sharing those surveys. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide and, and just thank you all for sticking with us. We're a little bit over time, but we're wrapping up. So um, I want to also say thank you to all of you who made it out to our 17 in-person events throughout the state. We really, really appreciate that and value the feedback that we received there. Um, we have one, uh, we have a series of um, tribal uh, engagements and consultations coming up. Um, a reminder, this is for tribal leaders, members, and representatives only. So if you work with any uh, tribal organizations, please um, share this information with them. Uh, the links are, uh, to register can be um, uh, received directly by emailing us. And that email is at the bottom of the screen. So those are upcoming. And then we will have a, a virtual event on July 12th as well. So next slide. Just as um, some, some wrap ups for our outcome area working group meetings, um, a reminder that we have um, workforce and economic development this afternoon. Um, tomorrow we have the health and uh, health outcome area working group as well as essential services, accessibility and civic engagement. Um, in July, we will be having a tribal collaboration outcome area working group and we will let uh, you know when that, uh, that date is, or that time is available. Um, also a reminder, upcoming we have the state digital equity planning group meetings. We have those on July 26th and October 25th, and those are, are rounding out kind of the, um, the planning process. And if we can go on to the next slide, um, what we are asking for you from you, excuse me, is um, to complete, as we said, and share the um, public survey with all of your friends, family, and networks, anyone that you know, please share this with them um, and complete the DEEM tool. We talked about both of the, there's two DEEM tools, um, one for um, organizations, one for ISPs, please um, complete those and contribute. And then from you, we will be providing a public comment period on the draft digital equity plan um, with all of the um, input and recommendations gathered from all of these meetings, as well as all of our in-person meetings. So um, again, a big thank you to all of you um, for being here for, for the last uh, five months of these meetings a lot that we've had four of them. Um, we just thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for being with us during your lunch hour. Um, and really, really thank you for all of the input that's gonna go towards the uh, digital equity plan for California. So I hope everyone has a fantastic day and we hope to see you um, at the subsequent outcome area working groups and at the state why digital equity planning group meeting. Thank you all. Thank you.